and we're on. Um, I'm Knud Oxnavad. I'm the uh, president of Norway California Business Association, uh, for short, NCBA. And on my board, and I think they're going to join us, is Tom Nordheim, Francis Mohajarin, and Humayun Moragebi. And uh, both Tom and I are at JPL, NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, before we start, I'd like everybody who signed up to go to the little bubble or chat bubble and put in uh, which state or country you're from. Uh, last time we had uh, people from the Middle East, the Pacific Islands, Australia, all the way to Norway, pretty much covering the whole planet. So uh, if you do that, uh, when I give an introduction, um, then we'll bring that up here in the, afterwards. Um, the uh, NCBA is an organization focusing on developing collaboration and the, the promoting collaboration between organizations, uh, primarily in California and Norway, um, also other states in the US. We have especially a close collaboration with NASA and JPL. Um, we work in areas from science, technology, culture, and others. We like to find special topics. We had a big um, conference, uh, two years of that, called SESME, where we looked at environmentally uh, sensitive uh, um, types of technologies for uh, ocean transportation, uh, given that California and Norway has rather a long coastline and uh, ocean is very important for both. Um, this time we focused in on ocean worlds, which also is related to ocean, obviously. Um, and uh, ocean worlds also contains ice and snow. And that is something Norway is rather uh, famous for. And Norwegians, I don't know if I should say this, but we sometimes think about Norwegians uh, pretty much breathing and uh, living is ice and snow and these good parts of the year. So this is something we're very familiar with. And therefore, we felt that Ocean World was, uh, Worlds was a very a good topic for collaboration between uh, NASA, JPL, and Norway. So we're working on developing uh, collaboration there. And as part of that, um, we also want to support the initiative at JPL. So we have this webinar, but we're focusing on ocean worlds. Uh, last time, that was in uh, December, we uh, had a speaker, Sam Howell. He talked about what these ocean worlds are, what they contain, the science we want hope to, to gather there. And of course, the ultimate goal of us going to ocean worlds from a NASA perspective is to uh, meet the goal of NASA, which is to look for life in the outside the earth extraterrestrial life so to speak and um, so that is um, the, what this aim the aim of this um, webinar series is and um, today we have colin carpenter who's going to talk about let's see let me go back here yeah that was just me remembering that i was recording so just give us a second here okay um, he's going to talk about accessing an alien ocean, ocean worlds, and the search for life, as we just talked about. Colin Carpenter, he works at JPL. He's a robotics engineer in the Robotic Vehicles and the Manipulators Group uh, at JPL. We call that uh, 347, um, only for JPL, that's interesting. Um, and he is at, the, as we said, JPL, or formerly said NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, part of Caltech, as well as NASA. The lab he has helped create focuses on rapid technology development and end effectors specifically tailored for gripping and extreme surface mobility is going to cover both today. Current work includes principal investigator, as we call PI, of the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor, or EELS, and EELS is what we call it. We sometimes forget what it stands for. But the important part is it's a snake-like robot aimed to access Enceladus Ocean through a vent that we see there, or we, imagine, we see, and we don't know all the details, but we have a good feeling about what they do. And these vents will then 
reach the ocean. So this is a way for actually reaching the ocean. With that, uh, well, before I introduce you, Colin, let's see if we have any on the chats, if people put in where they come from. Let's see. Uh, two seconds here. Uh, let's see. Everyone. John, California, New Jersey, Las Cruces, New Mexico, California. Let's see. We go further. Um, there we go. Yeah. Um, oh, we have more here. And we have. Okay, and then we have Earth. Well, that's a good one. Um, North Carolina, Colorado, California. I guess we are more focused in the U.S. today. Well, that's fine. Got a good spread, though. Colorado, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Okay, um, with that, Colin, I'm going to leave the floor to you. And before that, I'm going to make you the presenter. So we do this. All right, let's see. And then I go in uh, here. Thank you, Canute. Fantastic opening. My name is Kaylin Carpenter, and I'm going to tell you about a really fun project that we came up with 2015. We were, we still had Cassini. So Cassini was the mission that we crashed into Saturn in 2017. Right. And when we first went out to the outer solar system to Saturn, we didn't expect that we would find anything nearly so vibrant. We didn't think there'd be ocean worlds. In fact, we still were just realizing that you could have life that was not um, photosynthetic in nature, which now we realize on our own planet, most of life is not photosynthetic. Um, we don't have any idea what the biomass is that goes down into our crust and lives off of chemical energy throughout our planet. But we do know that life is insidious here and lives everywhere it can, even very near um, magma. So as we begin to realize how resilient life is, what we've also found is we have no record on Earth of what existed before the emergence of life. So there was probably all sorts of complex chemistry, things that would have led up to the genesis of life that was then consumed by life afterwards, because these are high, um, these are high kind of um, energy food sources. So knowing this and beginning to look at this, we look at the rest of our solar system and we have some fundamental questions we're trying to ask. One of them is looking for life, not of Earth, not of the same genesis, trying to understand what mechanisms may drive to that. The other thing we're looking for is what exists before that leads up to biology. Um, so there's a lot of great questions. So let me tell you about the eels robot. So why is it not moving to the next screen? There we go. So why Enceladus? So Enceladus is about a hundredth the size of Earth. It orbits Saturn every 1.4 Earth days. It's very young at the South Pole. So the oldest tiger stripe is about a million years old. The ice shell thickness is only about one to five kilometers at the South Pole. So this makes it one of the most accessible um, exo-oceans that we've discovered in our solar system. The ocean thickness is about 26 to 31 kilometers. So at the 100th gravity, each kilometer is what about um, a meter, Earth equivalent. So you're talking about 31 meters of pressure for Earth, so you're talking about where humans can actually scuba dive to. So we're not talking about needing any crazy technologies to be able to even get down to the rock water interface as long as you can communicate back. And we definitely know there's plumes. It looks like Europa definitely has plumes as well. We don't know if they're direct conduits to the ocean. Another very nice thing about Enceladus is Enceladus has um, Enceladus has less radiation on it than our moon. So it's a very benign environment, relatively speaking. So we didn't expect to find these plumes. It was shocking when Cassini saw that there were these jets of water spewing out of the South Pole of Enceladus. 
we th flew through them 11 times. Um, another thing that we went back to look at is, are these a short-lived phenomena or is this something that lasts a long time? So this is actually an image from Voyager. I forget if it was Voyager 1 or Voyager 2, but you can actually see at the bottom, we were able to capture that the plumes were happening then. And this is also what feeds the E-ring of Saturn. So this is producing some of the rings we're able to see with our telescopes and binoculars from Earth. So it is, you know, a rocky kind of silica crust. We have the liquid water that we just talked about the depth, and then we have a ice crust over the top of it. Some of the imaging we were able to do with Cassini showed the tiger stripes uh, thermal spectra. You can see Damascus sulcus, that one to the left is quite a bit warmer. This is indicative of either greater mass flux coming through the vent, or this is um, a thinner area and the ocean is actually closer to the surface. So either way, for now, we are actually targeting Damascus sulcus. So the plume, it tells us what's there. We have some very rich chemicals that if there is life, they could be consuming, but the presence of that much hydrogen, perhaps it means that it is not being consumed. Either way, it's more intriguing to want to look deeper into. The other thing that we find from this is um, to have that hydrogen coming out, there must be serpentization and there's interactions with um, the, probably with magma, and definitely with what must be a rocky um, core inside. The other thing we found other than uh, salt is we found silica. And so the silica shows that there's probably interaction with magma. If there's interaction with magma, it would be creating hydrothermal vents. This is the leading theory for where life started on Earth. So another thing that Cassini gave us is these fantastic images. So you can see we have these tiger stripes and these tiger stripes, because we have this plume ejecta, which is coming down like snow, uh, depositing about one millimeter a year. You take that over a million years and you know it will have filled in any rough spots and will essentially have a smoothed over terrain that is about 30 degree slope down to where these uh, plume exits exist. Um, to give you scale, you can actually see at the bottom, these are 100 to 150 meters high, two to four kilometers wide, and I'm trying to remember, I think it is about four meters per pixel, but it does mean that our lander um, would show up on these pixels, so you could see at the top of one of these ridges, there's definitely plenty of room to land, especially with the 100th gravity, you can essentially hover on your way down and pick exactly where you want to land very slowly and um, have a very, very small landing ellipse. So going back to the hydrothermal vents, the way that we think that's where you could have the genesis of life is you have a pH difference um, on the two sides of the chimney, which is created as you have all of the dissolved solids come out of solution and they slowly build up these chimneys. You have a pH difference across it, so you have a potential, you have a constant electrical charge. That electrical charge creates these water rock reactions which start building up towards self-replicating chemistry, and we believe at some point we'll make the jump to your biological um, interactions and metabolisms. There's two different models of what could be going on that match the um, observations of Cassini. You can see on the left, it looks like you have an open crevasse, and on the right, it looks like things have circularized. So here's an artist's rendition of these. So on the left, you can see these opening and closing vents. On the right, you can see the circularized ones. Uh, this is your cryovolcanic model. So we're not sure which one of these two it is, but we can actually design something that has the ability to look for, um, to get down these. So we went through, read all of the different papers we could. We took the envelope of what may exist there and we created a robot that could adapt to these differing terrains. So this is the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor or the eels robot. This is three of them coming off of a lander. We also have Prime in here, which is a melt probe, which would melt through the ice to get down into the ocean. 
here's our concept of operations. So in the hundredth gravity, because this uh, plume ejecta is not modeled to actually center, there's not enough energetics, so it's not gonna stick together. Uh, when you disrupt it, it is likely going to fluidize to not be able to take shear forces. So we have a swimming problem even when we're on the surface. So this swimming problem is something where if you have a bunch of propellers or Archimedes screws, you can essentially swim or burrow your way through this plume ejecta. We come up near the edge of the vent. We anchor ourselves to the surface before we stick our head directly into the plume. Now this full length, we're able to take samples. So we're able to ingest this fresh plume ejecta and be able to um, assess what is on the surface and go through concentric rings as we get closer to the origin of the plume to understand the heavier molecules that may be falling out of the plume. At this point, we're able to assess what is in the plume directly. At this point, we may actually get the first sample of liquid water directly from an alien ocean. If there isn't liquid water at this point, the forces are likely pretty low, so we can um, disengage from our anchor, and if the forces are low, we can repel down, we can essentially fall. When we get to a point we can no longer fall, we go into the spiral configuration, push onto the sidewalls. When we push on the sidewalls, these screws become these uh, self-driven modules, which then can push this ever um, conforming robot against the sidewalls where it can react both gravity and the plume forces. If this is the cryovolcanic model, there will be a, a choke point, a converging diverging nozzle. That's where we get the small diameter of the robot to be able to push ourselves through. Uh, near this point is the predicted point where the high tide of the ocean comes up to. This could be within tens of meters, it could be within a kilometer of the surface, but with lithostatic pressure, we know the liquid water will be within a kilometer of the surface. Uh, once we're in the water, we look around, we can swim and see if we can. We are swimming alone. So here's a artist's idea of what it may look like on the surface. So to give you an idea of the earth equivalency um, at a 10 centimeter throat, we would essentially have a force of 585 newtons on the robot, which is 60 kilograms earth weight equivalent. So if we have a heavier 80 kilogram robot that is going up against gravity, it is actually very equivalent to going down against the plume forces on Enceladus. So we'll, now we'll start talking about the Earth robot that we're building and how we're, the, this was all been about the motivations and the mapping to Enceladus. So this is EELS. This is actually very similar to the one that we have all of the parts coming in for. We have the remote sensing or vision head and science payload on the head. We have these serially replicated joints with these uh, counter-rotating screws along it. Each one's an identical module, so it simplifies the controls problem quite a bit. These are what we call the shape actuators with the active skin on the outside. Then we can have more science payload at the end. Our power management and our tether management is also on the end. So these are almost rattlesnake-like um, rattlesnake -like appendages on the end. We've been working with a digital holographic microscope that can actually look for motility or if anything is swimming in the water, even submicron. So if anything is swimming, even if it's tiny, we will be able to see it. Here is a lab view or a lab robot that we put together. What we're looking at here is our predicted forces versus our reactive forces to see how closely they match. Later on, we went through and started removing each of these panels to show we're robust to not having all of the screw threads in contact. So we then have been able to demonstrate the ground mobility. So here is the ground mobility with the screw threads. So they work a little bit like tracks to push itself along the ground. This is just um, going in a straight line. In a second, you'll see us um, doing figure eights. We have not cleared the latest, mainly because we have some publications out of some of our traversing up and down um, barrels. 
So we've been able to show that we can even be robust to non-uniform surfaces and go up against gravity. So this is coming along very nicely, but you can tell this is still very much a lab version with a bunch of 3D printed parts. So we're extremely excited to announce that we will have received follow-on funding to build the full metal version. We'll be able to take to Svalbard out into the field to demonstrate this, even go underneath um, glaciers into the water ice interface where we'll essentially look for volatiles. Uh, the volatiles are areas that work as concentrations of any organics and are potentially um, are potentially um, energy sources if there is any life. So we have a very interesting screw actuation. We have a single input on this version of the robot that gives us a um, counter rotation. This is a unique gearbox. The other thing we've done is we've changed the configuration of the joints where you can see each of these, we can lock a shoulder angle or essentially the angle between any of these joints. And by adding a rotation, you can see the effective circle that we make changes in diameter, but we always have the screws touching the outside. So this simplifies the controls problem quite a bit. So, uh, we have a bunch of autonomy challenges within this. One of them is rate of traverse. Most of our robots that you see on the surface of other bodies uh, over the space of 1.25 Mars years, which is two and a half Earth years, goes 15 kilometers, 20 drilled samples. Um, our goal is to cover 16 um, kilometers in so three kilometers in 16 hours. This is huge compared to other mobility systems that we've put on um, other planets in the past, but my daughter is able to run 5K in you know, 45 minutes or so. So we, we have to put it all in perspective. Now, the other thing that we have issues with is um, normally our robots are able to make maps using remote sensing. This is um, going down through Old Faithful. Oh, I thought it was going to actually show that is Old Faithful, but you can see we're not able to see very far ahead of us. So this means that instead of being able to be um, very deliberative, we have to be extremely reactive. And we also can't be reactive and just wait for someone on Earth to look at because it's three hours round trip, uh, time of flight of light. So we need to be extremely adaptive. We also need to be extremely resilient instead of extremely robust. So we're basically the other end of the spectrum of other missions that we've done in the past. That being said, the helicopter that we're sending to Mars, Ingenuity, is very much on the spectrum similar to the EELS concept. So the other thing we're doing is flow guided navigation. Because we don't know if it's liquid water, we don't know if it's essentially a fog, we don't know if it's mixed phase, we don't know if it's just a bunch of ice particles uh, that will occlude our view, we wanna be able to follow the flow down to the source. So this makes it so we're very robust to what we might run into so that we're not heavily reliant on something uh, that could be visually occluded. Now, the, we also are using proprioception. So proprioception is tactile. So this is a snake that is actually moving with a heading and they actually are just feeling their way um, off of the surface where they contact to be able to determine how to move themselves in the trajectory that they're looking for. So this is a collaborator at CMU who we're gonna continue to collaborate with. Then the other things we're looking at is can we actually, uh, through software, get rid of any occlusions that we may be seeing as we start going into these vent situations. So we had a meeting earlier today where we do have a vent chamber and some of the things we're gonna be doing is actually seeing um, what happens, do we get this phase change, what happens if it's multi-phase and what does that do to remote sensing? 
So this is kind of fun. This gives you an overall what the robot's doing. The robot would move its head back and forth to assess the flow. This is how it knows how hard to push in the sides. Um, over here on the side, you can actually see the different screws light up. So it knows which ones are in contact and it knows where to push harder into the sidewalls. So you can see um, th this isn't the latest configuration. That's why it's a little bit blocky, um, but has this ability to essentially assess the flow, where's the flow, um, change the heading, and know where to push harder into the sidewalls to ensure that we have a grip coefficient to react to forces that we're assessing in real time. Now, the other interesting thing that we've been modeling is what happens, this is series of so 3% gravity. This is where we start looking at the fluidization. So we've been able to pull these silica spheres, created a big test bed where we have these silica spheres. We can also um, actually aerate them to help essentially gravity offload them to start demonstrating some of this burring, burrowing and this fluidized uh, media mobility. Then, the other interesting thing is you can actually see, so here it is simulated moving through this unconsolidated media. You can kind of see the swimming problem here and how everything just moves around. So this is some very early threads. This isn't the best design. Um, right now we're working on actually optimizing them and we've been running a lot of simulations as well as tests to determine how best to do that and the best materials. So here is, this is another one, right? No, that's the same one. So then the other thing you saw that gripping at the um, end of the robot, it may actually be in the middle of the robot, but here is sublimation. So we've been working with sublimation, but since then, because you need the multiple points, if you're gonna get your force closure with sublimation. So we're also looking at freeze anchoring, where we actually induce a pressure gradient locally so we can have liquid water. And then that liquid water, we can suck up into capillaries, and then we can turn off the heating unit, let it freeze, and essentially like licking a light pole, uh, light post in the winter stick fast. So this means with a single point, we should be able to react all of our forces um, and do this with less energy. Excellent. So right now we are working on an earth robot that we can map to um, Enceladus applications. Thank you and any questions? <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much, Colin. Uh, always a pleasure listening to you, and uh, you always have new thoughts. Um, I, the, well, let me mention one, a couple of things. I said that the, we are very excited about wor working with ocean worlds because it's ice and snow in Norway, as well as we'll be here, a lot of pressure in most of these uh, ocean worlds. But having said that, um, you see there's a lot of robotics questions, autonomy questions, sensor questions. So any of you who are in research or at the university, um, these are really interesting questions to uh, grab onto. So we'd like to encourage you to think about, you know, what you can contribute to when it comes to ocean worlds. And uh, there's a lot of challenges. We're also going to talk later about the Prime, uh, which is a robot that's going to melt uh, itself, but uh, combined with uh, hot water drilling, Etc. into the or through the ice, I should say, um, on Europa. But uh, let's leave that. Um, since we're not such a big group here, um, we're a perfect group in terms of number of people. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, yeah, I see some of you are already writing questions. If you have a question, we can start at the top. Let's see, these robots look amazing. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> um, so what we can do, we can actually um, go, you can unmute yourself if you have a question, and we can start with Cynthia. Um, is that okay with you, uh, uh, Colin? Yes, definitely. And if you have a video, right. you're more than welcome to, to uh, show us that too. So should we start with you, um, Cynthia? You had a comment, but did you want to say something in addition? Um. No, no, I was just saying, you know, like I logged in late, but I mean, this looks straight like the, the computer out of um, War of the Worlds. <laughs> you know, it kind of imagines, okay. well, it's like searching like that. It's like, you know, that high tech. It's very nice. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's go back here um, and see who was next. That was uh, Cynthia, uh, Mark, 
Okay, let's see if everyone very cool. Okay, did you want to say something, Mark? I see you were second here. I'm sorry, I'm Rollins. Yeah. I oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Do yes. you have a video too? Yes. Okay. I was uh, wondering, can a segment from the robotic probe separate, perform an independent function, and then rejoin the main robot at a later time? So currently we haven't implemented that, but we've kept in our back pocket that ability for two reasons. One, when we get to uh, the throat, if the throat happens, if in our modeling we find that the throat diameter is smaller than um, the size we need to be able to have the actuators to react the vent forces, what we'd want to do, if we could have radioisotopes, we'd melt through. Right now, you can't bring radioisotopes to um, an alien ocean. So the alternate way of um, taking care of that is we could have a smaller front section. And that smaller front section could be um, pushed through by the larger back section. And then it would disengage to continue forward then the other thing we've talked about doing is something similar where when we were worried about buoyancy issues, having buoyant sections at the front that didn't need um, as large a motors because once you're in the liquid water, it doesn't take a lot, especially at 100th gravity, to move around. But then we realized at 100th gravity, it doesn't take much to counteract um, your weight. So because it's still water, it's still very dense and our motors are quite, quite capable, we could keep ourselves at the ice water interface without expending very much energy, even if we were as dense as lead. Excellent, excellent, thanks. I just have one more quick question. Uh, are you planning to include as an instrument an electrophoresis instrument capable of doing sequencing if, for instance, yes. there should be nucleic acids or something found? Yes, we are. Uh, so Excellent. a CF and an LIF along with the digital holographic microscope is baselined in. We have ones that we're going to be able to test in the field. Um, and then we're looking at many other instruments that we want to take along with us. So we've been following the latter life papers. Um, but then we're also looking into what you look for in a prebiotic or abiotic ocean. And there's huge debates there um, about complexity and is complexity a sign of life we can make right. that statement here on earth but we don't think we can make that statement if you didn't have life wiping out the bandwidth in between <laughs> um, so all right we were we have a lot of great questions that can be conclusively answered at enceladus enceladus yeah. is that way because it's a very controlled experiment Oh, there is one other place where we've talked about dropping off. If we wanted to go down to look for the hydrothermal vents, we could actually uh, disengage from the tether. If we can find either some way to do repeaters, or if we can show we could robustly come back to something like a sonar beacon to transfer the information back out. Right. So right. Those, those may be too far afield, but we definitely want to start pushing work like that on Earth. Because if that's too far afield for, let's say, the next decade, if this does get pushed back to one more decade beyond that, and we have shown that we can robustly do that on Earth, we could extend this out to actually look at the rock water interface where we'll mm -hmm. find hydrothermal vents, and that would be that would be the highest science returns imaginable. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, definitely. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Dr. Mark Elowitz, uh, you had some questions. Oh, that was me. That was me, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it was the same. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we had that. Was what I wasn't quite sure about that. Okay. But I need to sort of put my glasses off. Uh, Clindow, uh, do you want to uh, ask a question? So that sure. that's a great question. Well, yeah, yeah. My, my thought was is ultimately there there are going to be units that fail. We know that that happens in reality. So my thought was, since they're rotating in opposite directions, if if part of the unit fails, um, and this actually connects very well with Dr. Elowitz's uh, statement earlier, just moments ago, in terms of separate missions, what I was wondering is how interchangeable are these segments? And uh, if one segment fails, do you eject it and move another segment in? Or 
is there a different problem uh, to solve there? Fantastic question. This is one of my favorite ones, and this is why we um, started doing the experiment where we were removing sections that was in contact. This shows robustness to both the natural terrain, but because we have those shoulder joints, we can actually move a broken um, screw mechanism off the wall. And let's say those joints break, you could actually, or stop operating, you can use the next ones to move that whole section off the wall. Um, but I think we're gonna move to not counter rotating. And so that will make it even easier. And the interesting thing about how we're doing that is we have these super efficient outrunner motors. This is difficult for um, some thermal sense, uh, but it means they're very transparent. We don't really need much of a gear ratio. It means they're back drivable. And it also means that each one, when it's on the surface, um, we can, instead of doing the counter rotation uh, spiral action, we can move up and down. And this was the initial idea. We thought that the actuators would be too heavy. And so going to this counter rotating gearbox would save us a lot of mass. Uh, motor technology keeps getting a lot better. And so for about the same mass, we can do two directly driven uh, screw mechanisms. Now, if the forces aren't as high, we can run them the same direction. So each rotation, instead of pushing us forward in a spiral movement by one pitch, it actually moves us by a whole uh, circumference, the direction of uh, down, right, of, of the crevasse. Um, so we think the efficiency gain is huge. It also means because they're back drivable, they would just roll. We wouldn't have too much of an issue. Uh, in going to the counter rotating aspect, that is mainly driven by um, the cryovolcanic model where we have to go through the converging diverging um, um, de la vol nozzle. That's where the forces would be highest. And so in that case, what we would have to do is we would have to just keep anything that's not working off of the sidewalls or it's going to work essentially as a break. Um, but these things are so, so overpowered, we would literally probably be able to just drill ourselves down in as long as we can get the nose cone into, into the converging diverging nozzle. Um, but on earth, we want to mess with the robot as much as possible. We want it to learn how to um, keep moving itself forward despite whatever might go wrong because we're not gonna have people able to do anything. So we have to show we're very robust to all sorts of different failures. Okay, I guess then we got the next one is from Frank. Okay, now that sort of moved a little bit. <laughs> that is a great question, Frank. So this this is, Heather Design, one of my friends says, like, here, I'll let you ask your question. Go for it. Oh, um, well, you already went into it a little bit Frank, with you one of your other comments. Yep, right. um, but yeah, like you said, it's uh, about yeah. how it's how the movement is limited uh, with the tether and if it can disconnect from it. So the robot can definitely disconnect from the tether fundamentally. Uh, the main reason for the tether is if there is a throw and we have to just power through it, we will be pulling as much as one kilowatt of power instead of nominally, we're probably at about 50 watts to run this robot, um, potentially less if we're not running some of the instruments. So what we're looking at is, you know, and, and most batteries, because we can fit enough batteries for a week long, weeks long mission, maybe even a month long mission um, in this robot, but we can't draw power enough during during that um, during that sprint through through the vent. So the tether is great for that, but it's also really good for communication. We haven't figured out another way to communicate through what could be three kilometers of ice. So the distance of this um, tether is right now five kilometers long. And so there's a separate funded effort to do um, high voltage power transmission through these tethers. Uh, we want to pay for some of the active tether management work as well. Um, that was de-scoped in our last effort. 
So there's some really cool stuff that these tethers enable, whether it's on Venus, whether it's on Mars, whether it's on any of the ocean worlds, um, having these really thin tethers that allow us to do really efficient um, high voltage power transmission, as well as having um, fiber optic cables so we can do high bandwidth data transmission back is kind of a game changer for our ability to acquire very large data sets, send it back to a lander, and the lander can sit there, process it. It can essentially zip up nothing but the science data product, transmit that back first, and then slowly transmit the raw data for scientists to go through afterwards. So um, we're, we're becoming huge fans of tethers. And then there's also another effort because you see climbers and other people use tethers as a mobility mechanism and a safety mechanism. So we've been looking at aspects like that as well. So um, an early version of this actually didn't have the tether go back to the lander, but it had two robots, uh, one that would spot the other as you would move forward for some redundancy. So this one, what we did is we essentially put the robots together so it's just doubly long and we get our redundancy through the length. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Very, very good question. And if you have a camera, Thank you. feel free to turn it on if you want to. Hi, I was so, just wondering what the speed of your current design that is that you showed in the video doing figure eight, what speed of it as compared to your goal of three kilometers in 16 hours? So the three kilometers in 16 hours is kind of a funny goal. It comes from the uh, tidal period of Enceladus. Cassini didn't ever really see the vents just close tidally. Um, it does look like there's an evolution. Some of them close, it's probably smaller ones, not the larger ones that we're looking at targeting. Um, but there are people that think the whole thing closes. So we wanted to make sure that we had a goal in there that showed even if the whole thing closed up, we would be through it in time. It turns out to be able to do that, we only need to operate at five centimeters a second. Five centimeters a second is how fast our last rover on Mars went. It's very, very, very slow. To put in perspective, the large robot we're building right now is capable of one meter a second. So uh, <laughs> we, we're, we're pretty confident in our ability to do the three kilometers in 16 hours. Uh, more than that, there's a good chance we can fall for a good portion of that time. And so during that, I mean, it's, it's very low gravity, so you don't fall quickly, but the, this speed limit that we have in the spiral configuration or when we're a self-driven screw is one that would probably be fairly short-lived. So it's actually fairly conservative to say we can go three kilometers in 16 hours as much, much of that will probably actually be in liquid water or potentially in free fall. Okay, next one, that's uh, David Morrow. And again, if you got video, feel free to turn it on. Hi, uh, hi, Kanye. Thank you for the presentation. I think you already uh, answered this question. Uh, it was how do you plan to send the data back? And uh, I, I guess you already addressed it before. Okay. But thank you. Uh, very interesting. Not a problem. Well, thank you for your comment. Uh, there's so a cool th thing about these tethers is you can actually make them sensors as well. So we can get the changes in temperature distribution. We may even be able to get any type of um, uh, more Coulomb stresses which are going on. If there is any type of seismic activity or shearing between the vents, um, we'll be able to get changes in vent flow, um, all sorts of things. I mean, we do get about a 3% error um, per length. So at five kilometers, you start having pretty big errors. But if what we're looking at is relative measurements, it could be a huge kind of not just a global locator to ourselves relative to the lander, but it could be a um, science instrument essentially for the full length. Okay, and then we That's got a long question. Fiber from... optic sensing. Okay. And we've got a long question from Bill. Uh, Bill, uh, do you want to uh, go through that and ask the question? And again, if you uh, have a video, feel free to turn it on. I 
guess there is no bill air. All right. Uh, yeah. I just want to ask whether, yeah, I think you answered the question before uh, regarding the how long it takes. Just you, you mentioned before that the, there's methane detected by Cassini. Whether that methane is biological or non-biological in nature, that they can distinguish between that. And second question is, is the eel able to be sterilized that we don't bring any earth life form back to that ocean in Enceladus? Otherwise, we're going to be making you know finding our own things there <laughs> yeah thank you fantastic thank you thank you this is actually one of my favorite things um because i feel very very strongly that you have no business going if you can't be fully sterilized so early on we were looking at things that you'd have to bake at you know 420 c um or was it 500 and 500 C for 4.2 minutes and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but that's to get rid of everything, including prions. We ended up finding out that you can use, uh, we, we do want to bake parts, but you can use vapor hydrogen peroxide, which is extremely caustic, but it does degrade your circuit boards, it degrades all sorts of things, even as effect on your metals, but we've already quantified that. So what's cool about this robot is each module is the same. And so we can build the modules and they already have to be um, sealed to be able to go down into the liquid water. So we've been working with people in our manufacturing facility to actually do robotic assembly inside of the vapor hydrogen peroxide baths. So they would actually assemble it totally wetted by the vapor hydrogen peroxide with no chance of recontamination. They then would have um, be sealed. And so they would be sealed with vapor hydrogen peroxide inside of it, no, no gases from our atmosphere. And then you could actually seal them in the bags that um, they seal the parts in before flight. And so the question is, well, well, they actually have room size versions of this. So there's a good chance that we could do this with all of our um, all of our mobility modules. We don't know that we'll be able to do this with the instruments. So we know we'll be able to clean them. People might need to chemically clean them. There's some questions there, um, but there's other efforts working on those. But we do know from the fundamental side of things, we can get about log 12 reduction, which is what the medical industry calls full sterilization. NASA has yet to determine what full sterilization is, um, but we feel that they will accept and approve the medical definition at some point. And so we're just making sure that we have a path to reach that. Um, there is some other work we did where we were actually looking at using UV um, light the whole entire trip on the outside. So let's say the outside does get wetted by atmosphere, or it needs to be put together, or you know, there's a tear in the bag. If we have it in a UV bath for 12 years, plus all the cosmic radiation and everything else going on, um, we have some people in planetary protection who have run the calculations on that, and we can once again claim full sterilization. So we just, we're waiting for NASA to agree that that would allow us to go into the ocean, and we wouldn't go without that green light. Oh, the methane. I forgot about the methane. So the reason why we haven't been able to determine if the methane's biological or not biological on Mars is the presence of perchlorates. We have no reason to think there's any perchlorates on the surface of, uh, or anywhere in Enceladus, because um, for Mars, they're baked on by the sun's rays coming through the atmosphere without a magnetosphere. And so it basically is depositing over the whole surface for chlorates. That's, that's not something that's happening on Enceladus. We would definitely look into it more. But if we found methane, we can use the same detectors that were on MSL, actually. MSL has a detector to be able to tell the difference, but it um, gets false positives from the perchlorates. So every methane we've ever detected with, with the mission that's currently there has come back as being from you know, biological sources, but we have no reason to believe that. Even though it could be true, it could also not be true. So we never publish it or talk about it. Okay, should we go on to the next one? It has to do with power and recharging. That would be Curran Patel. Yeah. And again, Curran, if you have a, a video, please feel free to turn it on. 
Yeah, for sure. So, Kelly, thank you for um, doing this presentation. I really enjoyed it. Definitely. Uh, so, my question is: is for your your vehicle, your eel, is there any recharging capabilities for your main power source or your auxiliary power source? So, we know that it's going into a thermal vent. Do you have any thermal couples on the outside of the vehicle? Or if there's a pH imbalance, do you have any type of instruments that can take on that pH just like aluminum and copper and generate, you know, minimal voltage, so to speak, if it's possible? Ah, uh, the good old days. You don't know how excited we were to find out we basically had something that if you put a turbine over it, or you had little piezoelectric streamers, or you had, you know, a deformable skin, you could do energy harvesting all the way down. Um, yes, there's a lot of work looking into that. I am a huge, huge fan. Currently, we have not baselined any of it because people think it's, you know, yet another magic step, another risk to the mission. Um, but I'm, I'm a huge fan. One of my favorite things that I think I don't know how you do it because at the moment we don't know what the exit geometry looks like. We have some modeling efforts looking into that. But if you could cap one of these vents with one of these robots on the inside, all of a sudden you could fall for sure. And if you wanted to open up that cap, you would be through a turbine, you'd be able to generate all of your power just locally and make your life a whole lot easier by reducing the forces to get down through the vent. So there's some fantastic ideas like that, that you know they, they may actually be reasonable, we just don't know enough. And that's why we're looking at this huge um, envelope range adaptable solution at the moment. But as we learn more, because people are still publishing on Cassini results all the time, and there's still a lot of money that's being offered by NASA. We have these huge data sets. People haven't gone through all of it. They haven't cross-referenced different things. And so I learn more all the time. Um, in fact, some of the stuff that we're doing in the lab allows us, because we have the results from Cassini, we can recreate the range of things we think that's going to be there. We can recreate the abiotic, prebiotic, all of the different ocean environments we think could be there. We can then in the lab show that our instruments can conclusively tell us what we can find. Um, we can design this experiment so we can say it's very conclusive. I was um, sad to hear today that um, that Insights Mole died. And so Insights Mole never got down into the surface of Mars far enough to get the heat flux. So currently that mission has not told us anything about the core of Mars, right? And so this is a cautionary tale. That's an awesome mission, but we wanna make sure that we can conclusively answer the questions that we're going in on. So before we even talk about moving beyond these Earth demos, we want to have proved that we can conclusively demonstrate answers to the question here on Earth. And so right now that is um, that that is what we're trying to do. Colin, we, this is awesome. We got a few more questions and I see time is running out on us somewhat here. I see Cynthia is next. Do you think you yeah. uh, have, uh, we might run a little over time, but I'm, uh, there you are, okay. Cynthia Dorado. Yeah, like um, so so again, I saw your figure eight lab thing, and I saw your ice clamp thing. But you know, since I showed up late, did were they tested in the ocean, or someone says in Antarctica would be a good place, or is it just experimental right now in these tests? So our uh, collaborators, who <laughs> uh, slightly funny story, um, and you'll you'll understand a lot more as soon as I say it. This is a very large medical robot. Um, and so my collaborator that helped invent it does medical robots at UCSD. UCSD also works with scripts. So he has created an underwater version of this robot and they're building it right now to start testing it. Uh, we have collaborators at Sintef um, in Norway that we're hoping to be able to work with. They have underwater snake robots. The great thing about this is we don't have to worry about depth. If we can go down 40 meters, that would be the equivalent because of the lower gravity to 40 kilometers. Mm. So that's, that's pretty great. I was just gonna say, like, um, when it goes down the vent, is it also gonna come up the same vent or you're going to a different one? We don't plan to come back up. That's why we okay. don't have any radioisotopes on the robot right now. 
So if they won't let us land on the surface with radioisotopes, then the whole mission becomes battery only, which is what they've been talking about for the Europa lander. And another interesting thing is that's where this came from. Uh, as soon as we realized that we, we had a, other versions where you held onto a single wall and you basically climbed down very slowly, very carefully, more traditional NASA. The reason why this one's faster and tries to do the three kilometers in 16 hours isn't only the uh, tidal period, but it was also do, if we only had 60 days of battery life, how can we make sure we get into the ocean within that and have enough time to really conduct the research we want? So we're fairly agnostic to what the power source is on the lander, but if the lander could be an MMRTG, we could spend months on the surface. We could really learn a whole lot before we ever even venture into the vent. And then we could have this extended mission, you know, because you, you'll get decade or decades from a radioisotope driven mission. So imagine being able to get all of the data back, um, that it would be pretty amazing. Are they just sending one? <laughs> um, so you seen this picture, the last picture I had, there were three. Um, I don't actually know what they're going to allow us to um, send um, to land on Enceladus because it's such a small body. You can essentially land 1,900 kilograms uh, for the cost of getting into orbit. So we're not mass limited, but the mass limit comes on the getting out of Earth's gravity well. So depending on the rocket is going on and also depends on how much money we have to build the hardware, you know, um, to make sure it's sterilized, to do all of the other things that are necessary. The instruments actually will cost more. The instruments we carry will cost more than the robot. And that's because of the serial replicated nature. Okay. I mean, this, this is literally a 30 centimeter module 10 to 12 times. And so you do one and you have all of your tooling, everything set up to do that one. That's why we're saying we could have it uh, manufactured by robot in the VHP bath because we, we, we can. We can design the, the way that we build these things by hand. It, it all goes in one side. So, so you have something and then you place the next, you place the next, you place the next in. And then they actually just clamp together from the sides. So the way we made it easy for us to put together means a robot could put it together. But yeah, the uh, complexity with a lot of these microfluidic instruments and the ones that have the holographic uh, microscope, those start getting to a point where takes quite a bit more. Uh, Colin, we got uh, there, the next one I think you covered, and uh, that would be, first of all, Lindau, isn't that what it was? Yeah, no, Klindau, sorry. Uh, thank you for a comment. And uh, I think you talked about sterilization from Bill, so I think we're good on that. Yes, I think we should be we fine on that. to go to Lake Vostok. Yeah, that would be so amazing. We got, uh, Lake Vostok and the one about uh, from surface, contamination from surface to sub, uh, in ocean. So those are the two ones we have left. I'm sure you can cover so, them. So this, <laughs> this is also another awesome thing. So supersonic flow means that it's going faster than the speed of sound, which is faster than the mean free path of all the particles. So when we get into that, we are going to be air blasted and maybe even essentially sand blasted. <laughs> so if there is even anything left on the outside of the robot, it is going to be abraded and pushed out um, potentially all the way into the E-ring, you know, with escape velocity off of the surface. So we, we also have this nature that everything is um, pushing outward that helps give us safety from bringing anything from the surface down. So that is a really good question. Okay, so what about uh, uh, Lake Vostok? I would love, man, that would be a dream come true. I followed that work my whole life. And when they started getting the samples, the images and finding life there just blew me away. Um, yeah, and being able to get under that ice and explore even further and be able to demonstrate the readings um, with our instruments, being able to see motility, maybe even being able to see um, some of the things that maybe weren't in the samples we brought up, right? I don't know. I don't know how conclusive those samples were or if there's a seasonal change or blooms or anything else. But if we could have a long-term presence 
in Lake Vostok and actually get the, um, the redeposition of ice and melt thaw and how that might change the flora and fauna there and just really learn things. That's, that starts representing the data sets that we want to accumulate on these ocean worlds, right? We don't want singular data points. We don't want a binary, is there life, is there not life, or a smoking gun of life. We want to we want to start understanding these environments and environments have seasonal tidal changes. They have all of these different changes and this is what makes things interesting and vibrant. And so we need these long-term presence. We need multiple readings from multiple locations and that either takes a long duration mission or multiple units who are working in concert. Okay, then the last one. Would be... Thanks for answering those questions. Oh, okay, Nothing. pleasure. Um, and then I guess you've got another one. Is that the same Frank, right? Yeah, it's the same Frank. And this was contamination from surface on Enceladus to ocean. Yeah, he just, he just uh, answered my questions. But um, I would like to say this has been a really uh, interesting talk, so I really appreciate it. Okay. You're welcome. Well, stay, stay tuned. Um, we're hoping actually before this year is out, you will see the robot that unfortunately due to COVID is in boxes in a lab we do not have access to. Um, but we are hoping to be able to put it together and have the four meter one running around in caves on earth um, before we get to the snow. The snow and ice. Right. <laughs> I like that, Mark. <laughs> Okay, well, what I think we should do now is to open all the microphones and give uh, Colin a big applause because this was really awesome. And uh, do you mind doing that? Thank you all. <laughs> well, that worked quite well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> had to improvise here. Um, we, uh, uh, do you see my slide here? You do. Um, we are continuing this um, uh, the webinar series, February 10, you, we're going to have uh, Tom Nordheim, I don't think he was able to get on today, he's going to talk about Bruy, it's a uh, rover that's going to pretty much drive uh, under the ice uh, like a rover upside down, uh, and um, it's already been used in Antarctica, up in uh, Alaska, and a very interesting uh, effort, and he's going to talk about that. When it comes to March 10, uh, it will be uh, myself or Jean-Pierre Floreal, who's the PI for Prime. That is a robot that can access the ocean, or we hope will be able to access the ocean on, for example, Europa, through maybe a 10 mile thick layer of surface ice. And it's gonna be in there for a long time. It's gonna use a drill, a melt, and uh, water jets to go through the um, ice. And of course, 10 miles thick, it might even be more, it could even be 20 miles. Um, that is a rather extensive and there's going to be a lot of pressures. It's almost like a submarine going through here. It's not like an Enceladus, it's 40 meter pressure. This is like two, three, actually four kilometers on Earth. And that gets to be really difficult. If any of you are free divers, you know how much pressure it comes even at, you know, 60 or 10 meters even. So, uh, so there's a lot of interesting. Uh, talks coming up and we're also going to have a talk in April. We haven't quite decided that and uh, that will be about uh, the Sinta proposal uh, of developing hazard avoidance systems for our robots and that would also include uh, testing as uh, Colin mentioned um, on Svalbard and, uh, and uh, opportunities there. So uh, we will talk about that, and uh, that will be the end of this series. But we will, before we're done with this series, you'll see new things coming up. Um, what I want you to remember is that the link that you used today, you can use also for the next ones coming up. So that you don't, you won't get a new link. So just, uh, you know, uh, save that uh, into your bookmarks or whatever you want to do, um, and um, have it available. So that was what we had to say here. Um, Colin, do you want to say anything more before we leave? Thank you again. A, a fantastic talk, and uh, really appreciate you asking or answering all the questions. Oh, thank you all. This has been a pleasure. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much, everybody. Ben, I guess it's time to say uh, to uh, sign off, and uh, I'm going to save all these uh, uh, the uh, the log of the communication, the chat log, so we have that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. And to spread the word. We got some really interesting things coming up here. Thank you again. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome, Colin. Thank you. I think Colin left. Oh, okay, let's see. Go to me here. Right. Save chat mm -hmm. Two. So, okay. Oh, Francis, you're on too. I see. I see you're on, Chell. Or Chell. Thanks, Lou. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. I think it worked well, very well. We had up to 19 people. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, it's like there's actually about like 60, almost 60 people signed up. Wow.